Hey guys, welcome back to the Foam Frat Podcast. Tyler and Sam, we got a really cool episode on false capture. I interviewed uh, Judah Kreinbrook, Tom Boutelet, and Joshua Kimbrell. Uh, they just put out a paper on the concept. It was more of a case study of false capture when it comes to transcutaneous pacing. So you listened to the podcast, Sam. What were some of your thoughts? Maybe a little uncomfortable. I have to admit there was this uh, there was a spot that I want everybody to pay special attention to at the end. And Josh goes into this idea that you can miss a rearrest. And I was sinking down in my chair a little bit when I was listening to that part because that happened to me. Uh, we had a ROSC patient, Brady Down, right as we were pulling into the emergency department bay, which is, of course, where it would happen. And so we had pads on the patient, and we thought we had good electrical capture, which people will find out during the podcast that that's not always 100% far from it. Oh, yeah. And we even thought we had mechanical capture. We got a blood pressure on the patient, and everything is 2020 in hindsight. That was probably the patient's decrescendo from their blood pressure. <laughs> we probably caught it on the way down, you know. And so we were, you know, coming in, really believing that we were pacing this patient and that they had a blood pressure and that it was working. And the ED was also tricked momentarily uh, until the blood pressures just wouldn't come back at all. And then we all started thinking, oh, boy, what's going on here, you know. And um, the thing that kind of solved what was going on was a Doppler. They put a Doppler on the femoral artery, and there was a huge difference in sound between when they would do chest compressions and with pacing. But the interesting thing that really bugged me about it, and I thought about this call a lot afterwards, um, was that there was a slight sound every time the patient would be paced um, on the Doppler. It wasn't absent. It sounded mm -hmm. like it's a really weak pulse. And that was really confusing. I eventually ran across Tom's blogs on EMS 12 lead after the fact and, and learned about what was actually going on. But I thought that was a good framing for people to move into this podcast with is that there's a difference between something called a, a cardiac pump, which is where your heart's actually squeezing or somebody's doing chest compressions on it and a thoracic pump or like thoracic pump theory, which is where you have intrathoracic pressure changes and that can cause some egress of blood from the thoracic compartment. It's not really, it's kind of a pulse, but not in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. And then you mix that with electrical convulsions, and it turns out to be a procedure that's you know, probably a lot more nuanced than most people have been taught. So I think this will be a really eye-opening one for clinicians. It was a really good discussion, and their paper is excellent as well. Yeah, and if you go to the paper and you download that, um, you can actually see the pictures of what they're referring to when they say true electrical capture, um, because uh, just having that, that, you know, spike, and then you see a wide complex, that's not it. And you'll hear them, they describe it very detailed. Um, but to your point, Sam, yeah, I mean, when you're when you're pacing, you're still at the vulnerability of what the cardiac muscle can do, right? Yeah, you can tell it to pump, but if they have an inferior wall of I or if they have a sick heart, you may still have the issue to where that squeeze is, yeah, you got electrical capture, but the squeeze is not, uh, the inotropic function is just not there to do that. And um, we come across this on ultrasound where you'll look at the heart, you'll see that there's enough pressure to open up the aortic valve inside the left ventricle. Um, but you look at it and you're like, that's not doing a good job. Like just because we have cardiac motion doesn't mean this patient doesn't need CPR right now. They still need to decompress that, that left ventricle. So a really interesting topic. And um, if you're using ultrasound in the pre-hospital space, um, you will get another feather in your cap after listening to this because that's really the, uh, the telltale way of seeing if you have capture. That would have been very, very useful in that scenario. That <laughs> Instead, you got the doppel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the sound was very telling, but a picture would have been better. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, let's roll the episode. Let's see it. Um, we'll start off with you, Judah. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So, um, you know, I started off in my EMS career back uh I was 17. I was in EMT school, finished at 18. I was working in Sumter County, Florida, so central Florida. Uh, really cut my teeth as an EMT for two years. And um, at that time, you know, I thought EMS was going to be my entire career. Um, got a, got my paramedic and really found that I had a knack for um, reading EKGs and loved resuscitation, loved critical care, um, cardiology patients. And oddly enough, kind of fits, kind of doesn't, neurological emergencies. I love spinal cord injuries, stroke, that kind of thing. 
Uh, but anyways, um, as I cut my teeth in the south end of that county, if you look at it, it's like one of the most under-resourced public health counties. And we had, you know, I had plenty of pace, patients where I had to pace and, um, you know, had started to encounter, I think, some of this in the in the background um, and moved on to medical school. I just kind of fell in love with medicine and was like, I, you know, can't see myself spending the rest of my career, um, you know, in the pre-hospital setting alone. I, I want to take what I've learned here and move on. So I'm up at Duke University now, second year med student, which it's nice up here. One year we finish all our basic sciences, second year is clinical. So I'm already 60% of the way through clinical year. And then I've got, you know, a bunch of research time before I got to finish it out in the last year and uh, bring it home and go to residency. That's awesome, man. Awesome. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on, uh, Josh. Yeah. So I started my EMS career down in New Orleans in Louisiana. I uh, I started off as an EMT, got my paramedic uh, a couple years in, and I went to uh, work for New Orleans EMS, the municipal nine one service down there. I moved up to New York City in January twenty twenty, just in time for COVID pandemic. So I uh, started to like kind of earn my wings, I guess, in critical care there. So a lot of the kind of prones, ARDS, ECMO, ECMO patients that were moving around New York City, um, or ECMO candidate patients for the most part. Um, I have some experience in quality improvement. I've been the quality manager in an EMS department in Queens, New York, at Menace's Health Network for Jamaica and Fletching Hospital. And in the last year, I've been working uh, in the PEDS uh, critical care space. So uh, brand new needle, neonatal and uh, pediatric critical care transport program on Mount Sinai. Um, and I too am betraying my paramedic background and going to medical school. Um, so I start at Albert Einstein next year in the fall, um, and, you know, have a goal of being an EMS physician. So that's a little background on me. Man, that's, that's super cool. It looks like Tom somehow grew a tail during that, uh, during that introduction. If you're, if you're watching, if you're listening, you have no idea what I'm talking about. His cat just walked <laughs> across his, uh, his keyboard, but, uh, Tom, we'll move on to, uh, to you. Uh, you've been on the show before. Um, retired paramedic firefighter. You've done a ton of stuff with resuscitation. Uh, what is Tom doing these days? Or can you not tell us the international <laughs> man of mystery? No, I work for Laredale Medical now. So I work in uh, business development there. Um, and I'm kind of earmarked for EMS. And so we're just kind of looking at our global EMS strategy, uh, unmet needs within uh, the EMS market and things like that and how we can do a better job uh, reducing medical errors and things like that through medical simulation for some of our, you know, low frequency, high risk skills that we perform out in the field and how we can bring that to mastery and how we can leverage new tools like AI uh, to help us with our team brief debriefs and things like that at the end to say like how, you know, did we hit of our, all of our critical benchmarks? How was the teamwork? How was the communication? And, and so that's where my focus yeah. is now. So it's, uh, it's, it's, very fulfilling. All right. So let's let's get right into it. So <clears throat> you guys just came out with this paper. This came out, uh, when was it published? March, right, of 2024. And the title is False Electrical Capture in Pre-Hospital Transcutaneous Pacing by Paramedic, a case series. Where did this come from? You guys are not even in the same state. So how, first of all, what gave you guys the idea to do this together? And what was the, uh, the inspiration for this? Yeah. Um, so it's kind of started with a little, I guess, Twitter conversation that was inspired by one of my quality reviews of one of my par paramedics of several years ago. So we had transcutaneous pacing, uh, a case where I went back in our coach that review, your kind of in-depth ECG review um, of the cardiac cases with the LifePak 15. And we found, hey, this is false electrical capture. And I went to the crew and I was like, I did a Zoom call, showed them the ECGs. And they were like, I have never heard of this thing. What is false electrical capture? And I was like, you never heard of the guy, Tom Boutile? He did the blogs, like, you know, phantom complexes. They get bigger when the current goes up. He's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I was like, it's a thing. I swear it's a thing. And so I did a PubMed search and I was like, false electrical capture. And there was nothing. There was nothing in the peer reviewed literature that I could find that talked about this phenomenon. And so I went back to his blogs and I read them and I was like, what is this? Like, why is there nothing here? And I actually sent Tom a cold email. Um, I don't even know where I got his email from or maybe from Twitter. I don't, I don't remember exactly how I reached out to him um, and reached out to him. And, and sometime in that time frame, I like put out a tweet that was something along the lines of like, how is there no evidence for transcutaneous pacing and false electrical capture? We're, we're doing this whole thing based on 
dogma, like a best guess. I don't know, uh, based on some studies from several, several years ago, really decades ago. And uh, Judah ended up reaching out to me on Twitter. So sometime in this time frame, we came up with this idea that we could bring this false logical capture uh, phenomenon that I think people in tune to the EMS, like evidence-based medicine, clinical community that had seen Tom's stuff and listened to podcasts or into FOMED they knew about, but just wasn't in the literature. It certainly wasn't in the textbooks and it's not in the ACLS guidelines. And so um, that kind of inspired us to do that in-depth look. And I said, like, let's see how often we screw it up and let's design a study. I'd never really done research before and I didn't really have an idea of how to do it. Um, but between Judah Tom and some paramedics at our EMS agency, uh, we we got it done. That's awesome. Man. So real quick before I get into uh, Judah, you elaborating a little bit on, on your side of it, but um, you said you were reviewing the code summary and you were like, oh, this is false capture. What made you say this is false capture? Were you looking at, I, I'm not even going to say anything. What what made you clue in that well, that was I, false I had capture? bought into Tom's indoctrination a few years ago uh, from his blogs. Um, so there was this classic, what we called a phantom mm -hmm. complex in the uh in the paper and tom describes it that way in some of his blog this like wide arcing electrical artifact this kind of slurred stroke from the pacer um that is wide and abnormal and yeah. does not have a, a discernible broad qrs with a t-wave and so this was actually if i remember correctly mm -hmm. an unrecognized re arrest because we had done these uh kind of in-depth cardiac arrest reviews for a while because that was my one of my big quality improvement projects was improving chest compression fraction and pre-charging the monitor and using a metronome and things like that. And so that uh, when we saw that pacing, I was like, I knew that that wasn't. So um, that's kind of what what I saw that kind of perked my ears a little bit. Uh, Judah, so what, what made him reach out to you? Were you part of the uh, the the Twitter conversation? Was it X or Twitter at the time? I think it was Twitter at the time. Um, I don't think it had yet yeah. moved to X. So I've been active on med Twitter for probably the last like two or three years. You know, I, I've i kind of had some, I'm, I'm going to, you know, be a little vulnerable. I've had some issues with my like EMS identity crisis coming into medical school because I've just, you know, I've always loved cardiology so much. And so I spent probably the first year of medical school exploring cardiology and I had just been you know, kind of Twitter was my way of staying up to date on what was happening in EMS research and e in just pre hospital medicine in general. Um, and I started seeing this guy, you know, Josh Kimbrell all over the place. And I'm like, you know what? I've, you know, I had done some research during my gap year. I'd been running, you know, some papers to like close to publication and a bunch of internal medicine topics. And there were some things that were interesting to me, but I couldn't really get it out of my head that I had like really unique anecdotal experience out in the field. And I think a lot of medics do because you just encounter things that not a lot of other people encounter. You think about medicine differently than, you know, somebody who's trained straight in, in MD school or as a researcher. And so I reached out to Josh. I was like, hey, like, do you have any, you know, I saw like your, um, you know, poster at such and such. I forget what it was. And I was like, do you have anything that you're working on? We uh, started on some, you know, other stuff. And then one day, um, I think he like WhatsApped me or something. It was just like, hey, I've got this like false electrical capture thing. You ever hear Tom Boothley? And as uh, luck would have it, I mean, I've been, you know, reading Tom's stuff in, you know, the ECG blogosphere for forever. Uh, one of the guys on EMS 12 lead that used to post all the time was actually one of my mentors, Ivan Rios. He's a paramedic down in my neck of the woods. Um, and so oh, yeah. I, you know, I knew a lot about, uh, ECG interpretation and I had actually had a few cases that were like this where, you know, you could tell that there really wasn't any clinical improvement. And if you assessed it, uh, really carefully, you just knew there was something kind of off with the ECG. Um, uh, but those calls, and I think as our paper shows, like there's really, these are really sick patients that are getting this typically. Yeah. So let's, so let's get into the paper. So what did you guys do? This was a retrospective look at paramedics who thought they had capture. And then you went back and you said whether they had capture or not. Is that correct? Yes. Essentially, we did this retrospective look where we took, I went from the beginning of when we got code stat, which is physio controls, uh, like retrospective review software where you can do in-depth cardiac arrest analytics for the most part. So you can calculate chest compression fraction, chest compression rate. So we got that, uh, I believe, March 2021, which is when we started the study. And I 
went and requested an IRB because I'd already looked at some of these patients from a quality lens. And I went to our uh, hospital's IRB because we're an EMS system that's affiliated with the hospital system. And I said, how do I do this? How do I get started? I want to do March 2021 to present. And I want to look at every patient that had documented transcutaneous pacing by paramedics. And so we ended up setting up this research protocol where essentially I trained two paramedics on how to recognize electrical capture. And that was done using a lot of Tom's, uh, Tom's materials. We used cases that were not involved in the study. So we used other cases. Uh, and we had the two paramedics blinded to each other's responses, evaluate whether there was true capture or not. So one of like the fundamental things that I think uh, makes it makes this tricky, uh, I guess, for paramedics in like the acute resuscitation like environment is that it's easy. It's not easy. It's easier when you go back and look at these calls and you look from right when the pacer started and you can watch the electrical artifact we call phantom complexes. You watch these get bigger as the current goes up. And so we trained them to look at the specific spot where that phantom complex turns into a discernible QRS and T wave. Um, and so we went back, it was 23 cases. Uh, we went back and saw how much they agreed. They disagreed four times, which shows just how hard it is. And then I met with both of them and we all agreed on the final answer for the four cases. And so we also collected some data. We collected uh, initial current, set current, or sorry, initial and final current. Because sometimes they would set the current initially at like 75 milliamps and they would realize, okay, we need to go up. So 85. So we used initial and final. And then we had uh, some hospital values for a certain portion of the patients. So I believe 18 out of the 23 had hospital outcome data. So we collected initial potassium value because I wanted to know if maybe hyperkalemia was affecting these issues because uh, there's a lot of discussion about hyperkalemia causing difficulty to capture. Um, we talked we got uh, neurological status of discharge, CPC score, and a few other things just to kind of see where, where things are. And so um, that's kind of how we set the study up. And we did our analysis to say, how often are paramedics getting true electrical capture? And then, you know, was true electrical capture associated with increased blood pressure and survival? And so uh, we knew, as it, just with the way these things are, that a lot of people that hadn't been bought into this idea that electrical capture was hard and that manual pulse palpation was not reliable, um, that we would need to convince them. So one of the ways that we did that was connecting the before and after blood pressures. And so that was one uh, analysis we did where we found that patients in the true electrical capture group had a higher jump in blood pressure than those that did not. Um, so that was basically the, the framework for our study. And we just wanted to put it out, I guess, into the ether that, hey, guys, Maybe the way we do pacing is wrong. Like if maybe it's not, maybe this idea that you turn the current up until you see the QRS get really big and then you feel for a pulse and then you're good. Maybe that training is insufficient and we're not actually setting people up for success and we're not doing right by our patients. So uh, that was kind of the setup, basic setup for this uh, study. <clears throat> yeah, that's super interesting. So, so I typically, when I'm teaching pacing, I tell people to look at the pleth wave. And if you see pulse socks, if you see pulsatility on the pleth wave, then you have capture. Um, is there, is that hold true all the time? Is there any variance to that where that doesn't help and you could still have that and have false capture? Cause I feel like if you're generating enough of a pulse pressure to generate the pleth wave to detect that, then you have capture. So I, I kind of want to add in here, um, you know, yeah. One of my huge things and goals in my career is to make, you know, EMS and ED research more rigorous. And I think Josh did a really good job of explaining kind of our design features that, um, you know, would help others believe that what we had is really false electrical capture. You bring up a really good point. Um, but if you're rigorous and you go into the literature, there's actually cases in the anesthesia literature where pleth waves mat perfectly match a uh, venous pulsation. Uh, Scott Weingart actually has uh, a recent case in late 2023 reported by a Canadian physician where he had a patient in a ventricular escape rhythm or right around 20, uh, turns the pacer up really high, thinks he has capture, he's in the ED resus bay, he matches it with pleth wave, 
Um, and he actually winds up having to confirm capture using um, POCUS because his patient's not improving. And the pluck wave matched perfectly. Now, the exact pathophys as to why that happens, I don't think we know. We surmised in our paper that pulse ox could certainly be helpful. Um, but I think that there's still just so much that we don't know about how exactly to confirm it. One thing I think we can say for certain, looking at the literature, is that, that one, this has happened historically. Uh, capture problems have been noted in history and, you know, since the... Um, first TCP devices were kind of starting to get to market in the 80s. I think that we know that the um, that POCUS is likely the gold standard, right? If you can visualize the heart and you can visualize that you oh, have um, you know, matching there, you're great. But I think our main point is that there is a difference between electrical and mechanical capture, right? It, it would be, it w there, there is a possibility that you have an electric ca electrical capture and you don't yet have mechanical capture but if you don't verify that electrical capture piece logically you will never get mechanical capture it is impossible for you to get it um hence why you know we measure the blood pressure and did that in a blinded way the the raiders only had access to code stats so they couldn't even see the blood pressure they couldn't see the age they couldn't see who this patient was what who the, who the treating paramedic was any of that because you can get t waves in a, in pea right yeah so what is the T wave? What is that representing when you see that on capture that's making you see that you have true capture? You're saying you have true electrical capture, but you're not confirming true mechanical capture. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. Um, so the way we worked this study is we just looked at electrical capture. Where mechanical capture comes in is we looked at what did paramedics report, right? And so I think a big finding is that in all the cases of Elect of false electrical capture, which were over 80% of all cases, in every one of those cases, the paramedics said that they had a mechanical capture confirmed via manual pulse palpation. Gotcha. So, and, and that's, and, and we've all been taught, like, you don't feel the wrist, you want to feel like the femoral because sometimes it can cause like, you know, and I, I think you can probably feel a fake pulse anywhere. You know, it's such a, a poor, uh, thing that we're, <laughs> we're very poor at checking pulses. And I think you can feel phantom pulses. You can feel your own pulse. So you're saying in the ones where they had uh, claimed that they had capture, um, but you could see that it was not true capture. It was as phantom that they were still saying that they felt a pulse with. Correct. Them. Yeah. So Tom, what, what's your thoughts on this? So you kind of, um, you know, you put out this blog, you had this idea. They actually went out and looked at this did anything in this surprise you or was it pretty on par with what you had mentally projected? Uh, no, the findings didn't surprise me at all. In fact, um, I've reviewed now so many dozens of uh, cases of transcutaneous pacing over so many years that my default position is I'm very skeptical that it's actually going to show capture. It's it's so rare. It's a, it's a real treasure when you receive a case and it's like, wow, they actually had capture. Uh, in this case. So I think what ends up happening is, um, you know, you're, you're dialing up the milliamps and uh, the complexes are getting bigger and bigger. And also the skeletal muscle contractions are getting more and more pronounced. And it's pretty impressive, honestly, uh, when you see that. And the other thing that's notable that is a lot of times the patient's getting more alert because they're being stimulated by the shocks, you know what I mean? And, 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 yeah. and the skeletal muscle twitching. So like you're dialing it up, your patient's getting more alert, the QRS complexes are getting bigger, and uh, you haven't done this maybe ever before if you've only done it a couple times. And so at that moment, you're like, ooh, okay, this seems like an improvement to what it was, you know, a minute ago, two minutes ago. Uh, let me check, you know, a pulse. And, and I'll bet you these skeletal muscle contractions do produce some type of aortic pulse wave of some kind. Um, plus, you're hitting little bumps in the road if you're in the back of the ambulance. Maybe you're feeling your own pulse. Um, it, you know, you're definitely probably still feeling the patient's underlying rhythm. They probably have an underlying rhythm, maybe not at the same rate that you're trying to, to pace. So I think it's a culmination of all this stuff plus wishful thinking. Um, that that you feel something that you mistake for a pulse, uh, and 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 when that happens, then then you know the, the, you're you're going like this, this first departure from what should be happening and what is actually happening. You know, you've 
he fundamentally misunderstood the situation. Um, and that's particularly tragic if that masks a systole or masks a shockable rhythm or, or something like that. Like there's, there can be other consequences to all this. Um, but I think it's really, really understandable from a human factors perspective why it occurs. So let's say I'm a paramedic. I'm listening to this. I'm going out and I have a patient who needs to get paced, right? Um, and we'll say that I get there, their heart rate's in the 40s, and I am trying to figure out after listening to this, what do I do with this information? Where do I take this? How do I apply this? Would you guys agree that you should turn up the capture until you see a spike with a complex, Y complex, and a T wave? Once you see that, you know you have electrical capture. And if you're getting higher and higher and you're not seeing that, you may need to realign the vectors, right? Maybe instead of going here, anterior lateral, you go anterior posterior. You start changing that up. Similar like what you would if you had a patient who was in refractory VTVF and you couldn't shock them out of it, you would want to start changing that up. Do you guys agree with that so far? Yeah, I... I'll go first. You know, I think the the caveat would be the research is very clear. AP over AL off the get go. If you look back at the randomized controlled trials that even showed a slight uh, like subgroup analysis of the patients with symptomatic brady, because remember TCP was originally a cardiac arrest therapy. Uh, but if you look at those trials, they started off near 200 milliamps, um, and they you know didn't actually use ECG data at all. They just went really high with the current and they went for it and they were mandatory AP in those trials. So they had to um, put it at AP. There's a recent study I can link anyone to out of the University of Maryland's published in circulation. Uh, AP was, you know, 81% more likely to capture than AL um, within a study that was done in the electrophysiology lab. So I think it's very clear to me that both for defibrillation and pacing, we should be placing pads in AP. Frankly, I think we need more rigorous research to move most pad placement to AP in general in professional mm -hmm. resuscitation. Uh, but I think that's my bias. I think the other thing paramedics should take, um, you know, take from this is don't trust pulse palpation. Um, don't trust one modality, like one way of checking it. Um, and look, you know, make sure that you're keeping an eye out for false capture and rearrest. Because if you don't see that that turn to the T wave, and you're not really sure, and you've seen, you know, blood pressure improvement, level of consciousness improvement, skin side improvement. I mean, these are patients that are in profound shock, presumably due to rate. If you truly do have their rate up. You should see bumps in all these metrics. And then there's, I think, some thought that you should see a bump in ETCO2 as well. So there's a possibility of looking at that. So th we've talked about the true, ca the electrical capture component. Um, but as far as the mechanical, yeah, you could try feeling for a pulse, right? But we know that according to this, that was unreliable. What was it, 70% of the time? I can't remember exactly what the numbers were. But qu all of the, well, I guess, uh, uh, did all the ones with false capture said yes. they felt the pulse, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so a hundred percent of those, but then you also had some that actually felt the pulse that they had true capture as well. What what are, what should we be doing to okay. quantify or qualify? You know that they actually have mechanical capture. Um, you said bumps in blood pressure and tidal CO two. Is it a multimodal approach? Do we use pulse ox? Fill a pulse. If you have ultrasound, use that. There's not really one gold standard for it. I it, there's not, and I don't think that we've done a good enough job in simulation for this as well. Like the times that I've seen this simulated, like you might set a capture threshold just because you don't know any better. You might set it for 60 or 70 milliamps. It's just completely unrealistic. And, and that seems to be like that threshold where people start to question themselves once they get up to like mm. 70 or 80 milliamps and the patient's really twitching quite a lot and they can see something on the monitor seems to be that point at which they kind of lose their nerve. Um, but it's not at all uncommon for capture to be achieved at 110, 120, 130, 140, 150, 160. <laughs> so as long as you understand that, like, I would be very skeptical if you're pacing at less than 100 milliamps. Uh, you know, you might be getting that skeletal muscle twitching, but like you need to keep going. And and honestly, I would say, I, I would even, if you really, really were comfortable and knew what you were doing, I would dial it up until you got capture. 
I would dial it back down until I lost capture, and then I would dial it back up until I gained capture again. So I'd be like, this patient gains capture at 110 milliamps and loses capture at 90. You know what I mean? I would just go up and down yeah. a couple times uh, just to verify that to myself. But I, I also agree with using an instrument. Um, I would use SPO2 in a pinch, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust it 100%, but it's better than I think not using it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and of course, if you have bedside ultrasound, I would firmly endorse that as well. And then just because you're feeling a pulse, carotid, femoral, whatever, that's not enough. Like measure it, count it over 15 seconds, multiply by four, make sure that you're actually getting that number and then comparing it to the pacing rate. It's not enough that you felt something. Yeah. You know, when we're, uh, when we're looking at pressors and stuff, you know, typically people have a stop point where they're like, okay. If I'm up to hit this on this presser, what are we doing wrong? Like, let's think, is there something else we should be adding? Is this tamponade, blah, blah, blah. Um, do you have a spot? And it, there's probably, is, there's no literature for it, but do you have a spot to where you're like, and I'll start off with Tom. Do you have a spot where you're turning up the pacer and you're like, hmm, this seems weird. And this could be something like uh, hyperkalemia. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever tried to pace someone with hyperkalemia before you know it's hyperkalemia, but it's extremely difficult and it, you're better off giving them a gram of calcium. But there's got to be a spot on there where you're like, oh, this seems weird. And Tom, you said if you're getting captured below 100, that seems kind of odd. It's possible. Um, it is yeah. possible. It just seems unlikely based on the cases that I've reviewed, especially with like a life pack. Um, but, you know, as regards hyperkalemia, there was um, I don't want to call it a famous podcast. You'd have to be like a uh, somebody like us to think it was a famous podcast. But I'm pretty sure Stephen Smith was on EM Crit talking about this very issue and was basically like, absolutely, if you're even thinking about doing transcutaneous pacing, I would go ahead and give calcium uh, because it's mm, cheap, benign, and life-saving, and there's not many things in emergency medicine we can say that about. And so often right. it ends up, they call it the great imitator for a reason. And, um, so, so my, my, uh, my threshold for giving calcium at the same time, you know, it, it, it wouldn't take much, you know, the, that's for sure. I, I think that's very wise to have that in your differential diagnosis. Yeah. I think I, I wouldn't have a specific current where I would say, okay, now is we need to try something else. But I think what is really important about transcutaneous spacing is you should always be skeptical that it is being done successfully. So whether you have focused pulse oximetry, femoral pulses, you, you, whether you are certain you have a QRS and a T wave on that monitor, you should be continuously vigilant and skeptical that it's working. And so, you know, using all the tools that you have, consistently thinking, hey, I might be doing something wrong. There might be, might be something off. And I think that's where we, we like fail our, our paramedics when we're educating them, when we're training them early in the process and throughout their career, because when you, and, and we've alluded to this already, when you're in your initial EMS education, you're learning about pacing, you, you get your ACLS case and your patient has a sinus bradycardia at 40 and, oh, I give one milligram of atropine. Now I used to give 0.5, whatever. Now you're one milligram of atropine and, oh, it doesn't do anything. Like, okay, well, I turn on the pacer. I increase the current, so I'll get electrical capture, which always seems to happen where 70, 75 milliamps, which is where all our median current was for our false electrical capture. You stop there. And, you know, it, I think a lot of our paramedics kind of, you know, life pack has that dial that you love to just like roll. And, and I think there's this tendency to go up um, to kind of that number and then look and say, oh, it's wide. Because there's a difference between the way that false capture, that phantom complex looks at 75 milliamps because there's more artifact that's disrupting the ECG. So it looks like it could look like a, a QRS depolarization. And so I think fundamentally slowly increasing it while you're skeptical, slowly increasing it, not that we're sitting there with a dying bradycardic patient and wasting our time, but methodically going forward. And once you get that electrical capture, really making sure that you, you check with all of your skills. Yes, you're going to check a femoral pulse instead of a radial pulse or a carotid pulse. Yes, you're going to use pulse oximetry and see if you get a pleth wave with each QRS. Yes, if you have focus, you should uh, focus the heart or at least the carotid to see if there's pulsatility there. And you should see if there's a boost in capnography. And with all of those things, you should still be skeptical. Um, so I wouldn't encourage like a certain point where you're trying something else. I would encourage you throughout the, throughout the process 
to doubt the efficacy of the intervention and to consider on all of these patients, is it possible they're hyperkalemic? Is it possible this is like a brash syndrome? Um, you know, all these different things that could uh, cause the bradycardia that we might not be fixing. We're just temporizing if the pacing is successful. Awesome. And, and I'm going to put a, uh, a link to the show or to the study in the show notes. Um, and then if you have any of those pictures, I, I couldn't see, did you have some of the pictures of what yes. that looked like in the study? I'm looking at it on, uh, it's probably just the read only. I don't have the full text of it, but did you actually have in there yes. the pictures? Of so the that's ECG? actually why we used, uh, why we use case series as the subtitle. Some people might've called this a retrospective cohort study. We used case series because we wanted to use the discussion to, to show images from the case uh, and actually go into detail. So I'm also happy to send anybody a, well, yeah, no, that's perfect. I'm, I'm that's happy awesome. to send anybody a PDF um, with all of it. We, we go through three cases. So our third case actually has the trademark plus wave with each QRS. So you can really see, um, hey, it's true electrical capture confirmed by the plus wave. This patient survived. It, it goes into a little more detail which I think those kind of clinical vignettes, while they aren't always as valid as a N equals, you know, 30,000 study, um, I think they're really powerful to clinicians and they really show right. why why this issue is important and how it works. So I'm happy to uh, send some of those images um, and, uh, you know, get anybody the PDF that wants it. All right, Josh and, uh, and Tom, and it looks like Jude had some internet issues, so he'll be back here in a second. But um Let's say you guys are coming in and you're the flight crew, you're intercepting with a paramedic ambulance and they are pacing somebody right now. And you have to do what I call the electric slide where you're switching from their pacer to your pacer, uh, from their monitor to your monitor. Um, I, as far as I've seen, there is no clear documented good way of doing this. And you will see people go, well, if they're anterior posterior, I'm gonna go anterior lateral, blah, 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 blah. Uh, what would you do, Josh, yeah, in that situation? Um, I would do exactly that. So I imagine, and because most of these cases, it seems like from the now one cruise, but not all of them, but most of these cases, you go to that anterior lateral because that's what we're comfortable with. That's what we do in our cardiac arrest for the most part. So I would start with anterior posterior. Um, and I think it's perfectly reasonable to um, kind of titrate one up and one down. I, th that's the process that we trained our, our paramedics on with the receiving ED. So let's say... Uh, I guess first making sure they have electrical capture, which I know is the, the whole point of why we've been here. So making sure they have that. Um, and if they do, um, slowly down trading one, one current, increasing the other, um, until we get to that same mark. I think it also depends on the patient. I think a lot of our, you know, some of our patients can probably withstand a little bit of, uh, uh, a, a little bit more than others. So being cognizant of, you know, one patient, if you just, I, I think we all have heard it or most of us have seen it when you're in the ED and all of a sudden they yank the pads off and that patient is now not being paced and crashes and went into mm -hmm. a rest or something else. And so, you know, I think using that clinical judgment, but yeah, slowly down, down titrating while we're increasing the on the other one um, and confirming capture on both once we get to that point. Tom, what about you? Uh, yeah, I actually wrote a Twitter thread on this. I'll send it to you for the show notes. But I think, you know, we're talking right now about how, think about it, there's, you know, it, 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 not not to be in any way disparaging toward any clinician, but I think your first responsibility is to verify capture on the first device. So if you're arriving on scene and they're pacing at, you know, 70, 80 milliamps and they've got false capture, obviously that's the first thing that needs to be addressed. So I would say, Number one, verify electrical capture on device number one. Um, in particular, I would look for the presence of a broad T wave, you know, with a distinct uh, ST segment. And, um, and, and, if I, and, and I would at least look at the PLEF uh, waveform. And then the second thing that I would do is ensure that the ECG leads are properly attached because uh, if they're not, then it basically goes into non-demand pacing. But at that point, if you turn off the monitor, you won't be able to turn the pacer back on. So double check and make sure that you've got your three lead attached um, because it's it's important that that remains attached during you know this transfer process. And it's really important also that you don't turn off any of the monitors. What you want to do is pause external pacing 
on device number one. And when you do that, obviously, if it's underlying asystole or it's not a life-sustaining rhythm, you would, you would immediately stop. As far as I'm concerned, you know, the patient owns that device <laughs> for as long as they need it, if that were actually the case. Most of the time, they're going to have an underlying rhythm. Maybe it was insufficient. Maybe they're hypotensive with it. But let's say it's underlying sinus bradycardia at a rate of 30 or something like that. What I would do is uh, pause it and I would check the blood pressure with device number one, with rhythm number one, with the pacing paused. And I would get a site of vital signs and I would reassess and basically say, is transcutaneous pacing still warranted? And if transcutaneous uh, pacing is still warranted, um, then I would attach the ECG leads of the second device. You can put those uh, electrodes right next to the existing electrodes if those are uh, paced properly. Um, and then I would take the new defib pacing pads. If you're in the standard uh, pad position for device one, I would put them in anterior posterior position for device number two um, in, the, in the anterior posterior position. And then I would pause pacing if safe to do so on the first device. And then I would increase the milliamps on the second device into 10 to 20 milliamp increments until true electrical capture uh, was achieved. And then once it was, I would get a new set of vital signs on the second device. And if you're satisfied that you have capture on the second device and you're happy with the blood pressure and vital signs with the second device, then I would go ahead and turn the first device off and take the leads off and, and then you're done. Uh, but I, but I think you should be very thoughtful about it and maybe even put it in a checklist. Yeah. I, um, I had a situation like this. I've had several and they're almost always in the anterior posterior when I get there and you know, I'll look and like you said, make sure you have true capture, but if they have true capture, I am tempted to say, let's get this set up to take theirs off, put ours on in that same spot at the same milliamps and not risk the going anterior lateral. When I know that that's not, as good and then have to take them off because I've gotten myself in trouble a few times of going anterior lateral and slowly doing the thing, returning this one up, turn this one down and not being able to get capture in the anterior lateral position. So I did, I mean, that was my thought process is like almost like when you're, you know, you're switching like a presser or whatever, you know, but I guess not exactly, but bringing one in, bringing one out. But I, I'm curious, like knowing anterior posterior is, is going to get us the best option. If you walked in and they had great capture and their anterior posterior, are, do, are you worried? Are you going to lose anything by coordinating it to be like, Hey, we're going to match what they're at. We're going to take these off, put ours on, and we're going to go right into it. You're talking the most of, you know, a couple seconds that you're doing that. Um, is that, it, it, would that be wrong to do? No. I don't think that would be wrong to do. I, I think what's more important is that you're thoughtful and you have a rationale and that you've looked at the patient's underlying rhythm and you've thought about their clinical stability first before you do that. What do you think, Judah? Yeah, I mean, I think um, transfers of any kind are always hard, right? Like that's where we're error prone. Um, I would hesitate to go from AP to AL for sure. I would also say that if you're getting captured a certain milliamps that you want to recreate those conditions as best as possible. Um, so I, you know, I agree with Tom. Like, I think you need to un assess the underlying rhythm in order to make sure that capture had really been achieved, right? I think that these situations are often dramatic and something we didn't add in earlier, um, we talk about this concept of pseudo pulsatile flow. Well, where does it come from? The force from transcutaneous pacing, we've seen it. It's as it, and it's measured. It's as if somebody's kicking you in the chest. Well, what other thing do we do where we theoretically kick people in the chest? CPR. That generates some pulsatility, some flood. And so they've actually they actually did studies back in the eighties showing that TCP at these currents generates, you know, pseudopulsatile flow. So I think, you know, again, just circling back, sounding like a broken record, just be, you know, trust but verify, be skeptical that this whole transfer process is going to go wrong. And I would say try to recreate whatever conditions you verified through multiple means um, and you, you're sure that you have capture, right? 
Because if you don't have capture, then this is all kind of a moot well, point, right? Like, Rip it off, put them on yours, and and start trying to do it the right way. So I, I think that's a, a great point. And um, where I fly, we do use ultrasound, and it's extremely beneficial. Like I can look at it and be like, yeah, you know, that looks good. That looks like a a good squeeze on the yep. heart, you know, for to to break it down simply. And that that's very helpful to see that. But I know there's people that they don't all have that, you know, so I think those are all, uh, all fantastic points. Well, guys, that was a great discussion. Great paper. It's cool to see, uh, paramedics out there doing studies like this and uh, keeping it alive. So kudos to, to all of you guys for doing that. Is there anything else that you guys would want to add before we, uh, before we break out? I, I think we, uh, something we haven't talked about and I'd love the love listeners to walk away with is if you're so sure about transcutaneous pacing, you need to ask yourself, what's the evidence that there are equivalent treatments to transcutaneous pacing as it currently stands? If you never improved your transcutaneous pacing skills, what are the equivalent treatments? And they've done head-to-head -head trials so far. Nothing has been powered high enough. We still need more evidence in the research space, but you know, using your chronotropic agents appears with whatever degree of background false electrical capture is occurring in normal practice, um, you know, dopamine, you know, throwing epinephrine on, you know, all the, all the other, you know, options that you have at your disposal. Make sure that you're doing those concurrently with transcutaneous pacing after you've, you know, improved your skills. Yeah, you're still remaining skeptical, but like nothing's saying that it isn't a both and situation. Uh, to get the best outcomes. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to get false capture <laughs> with a Lucas, right? Just strap that bad boy <laughs> on. and. <laughs> uh, I would add that one thing that I think we didn't touch on enough in the paper that I, I wish we would have is the difficulty of transcutaneous pacing in the post, immediately post-arrest patient. So there are a couple factors. One, Tom mentioned earlier, if you don't have the three leads on or the, you don't have the limb leads on, you're not going to be able to see if you have capture because it's going to be in a non-demand non -demand pacing mode. Well, we I saw a case with our crew, and I'm sure Tom has seen this too, uh, where pretty immediately post-arrest, they have a pulse, all of a sudden the heart rate comes crashing down, and they go hit the pacer button, and then they're like, oh my God, why is there no ECG on the screen while I started pacing? So that's one aspect. And then the second aspect, these patients are just so sick that this already really difficult procedure um, gets even harder. And that idea of, oh, I can feel the pulse. These patients are hard to feel a pulse on when you're not having them convulse with these skeletal muscle contractions uh, once every second or maybe slightly more. Um, and I think third element to that is if you have false electrical capture, right? So if the if the pacer pads are applying enough electricity, enough current, to arc and it looks like a QRS to you, you're not gonna recognize them go back into cardiac arrest. And so my hunch is that there are probably patients mm -hmm. that are having rearrest that is unrecognized because false electrical capture is getting in the way of that. So I would be, I wouldn't say don't do it post arrest because I'm a proponent of aggressive post arrest care, but I would be extra skeptical for those patients. and I. And I, and I wish we had pushed on it a little bit more in the paper. Excellent. And I don't know if we discussed it, but the thing you're seeing after the pacer spike, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, that's actually from you applying electricity to them, but the monitor kind of blinds themselves to it a little bit. And then when it turns it back on, you're seeing the tail end of that. Is that correct? That's that's very well said. That's exactly right. Because if there wasn't that blanking period that lasts about 40 milliseconds or like one small block of ECG paper, you'd see the current run right off the ECG paper because all that electricity is running from the two pads. So the the straight vertical line that we call the pacing spike is just a graphical representation, the computer letting you know it's about to pass current through the pads. And then you're at, you're right. The monitor shuts its eyes while that happens. In theory, it opens its eyes enough time to see the QRS complex that it creates. But I think it creates it, it catches the tail end of it. It's called echo distortion, at least uh, by some of the manufacturers. And uh, and um, like Josh said, the more you crank up the milliamps, it grows and grows and grows and grows. 
And it's astounding how much that can look like a QRS complex, honestly. Um, but it has an almost perfectly vertical um, takeoff. And then it has this like gradually curved focus best to baseline, not a distinct SD segment. So it, if it might have a little pseudo T wave, but not a distinct SD segment and a really identifiable T wave. But that is something okay. that you need to be taught. And there's just nothing in our textbooks and the way we simulate it right now needs to change for us to be able to do that safely. It's in, it's inherently learnable. Once you know it, you know it. Uh, we just need to do a better job teaching it. I'd be tempted to look at some of the simulation software and see if any of them don't have the T wave in there when they're simulating so this. I, I did want to add this for the listeners. Cause I know like we've got a bunch of resuscitation nerds listening to this. Yeah. You uh, grab the uh, latest ACLS experience provider manual. Tom, you might know this. They do have false electrical capture with not the same terminology, but they actually have quite a few cases of false electrical capture. They talk about this worry that, you know, not recognizing, um, you know, rearrest is a danger here. I, I truly think, and I'm going to throw this out there from the research side, I think that we need to immediately start testing this device head to head with chronotropic agents. And if we can't solve this problem in a year or two, I think we need to like, I think we need to do something because if this is happening at the rates we saw in our paper, I think like this is an immediate patient safety issue that needs to get solved. And a distraction, yeah. right? I mean, it's distracting you because you think you're, you're applying and you're providing this life-saving intervention when it's all smoke and mirrors and their patients know better off than before you got yeah. there. Awesome. Well, Tom, Josh, and Judah, thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to come on. Um, you guys, awesome work on this paper, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Tyler. All right. Thanks, guys.